And dear God, I thank you for this time that we can be here, that we can sing praises to your name, that we can um, play these games, uh, that we can fellowship with other believers. I pray you'll make us excited about the word. I pray that you'll just help us to live lives that are obedient, honest before you. I pray that you'll uh, truly give us a life that we um, we love, that we enjoy living for you, that we give to you, that is one that is uh, just faithful before you, that is beautiful for you. I pray that our life would be representative of what Christ did for us. Um, help us to pay attention today. Help us to really uh, understand the word. And uh, just help us, no matter what situation or thing that's going on in our life, to trust in you, to look to you, to spend more time with you. And um, yeah, give us hearts that are attentive. In our prayer. All right, so I pulled this up like 15 minutes ago, but maybe it was because I was super excited to be getting into this. Um, but for today, to continue on the series, we're going through 1 Timothy 4. Um, and so if you guys have your Bibles, you can turn there. Again, 1 Timothy 4, we're going to go through verse 1. Hey, Nathan, is the, is the other mic better? Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, are you guys all at First Timothy four? Yes. You guys there? Um, and if you're using your phone, just try your best uh, to stay on the Bible or your notes. Uh, because I know how easy it is. Like, you get your friends messaging you or an Instagram post comes up. Um, yeah, and kind of try and help each other. So if your friend gets, like, distracted, that's why it's better having a paper Bible because it's easier to pay attention. But I think if you are using your phones, um, yeah, make sure not to get distracted. I know the verses will be up here on the, type, on the screens, too. So... I'm just going to read through 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 to 10, and I'll go through the whole thing, and then we'll just go through it. So it says, actually, I don't have a clicker, by the way, so you guys good for today? Cool. I love trusting in the, uh, the AV. It just makes it feel more exciting. It says, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the insincerity of liars who con whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything God created, everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of of the faith and the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irrelevant, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. For it holds promise for the present and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Okay. Um, you can kind of tell the text. Today is it's a fair amount. Um, and also, some of it maybe doesn't make sense, and the other, other of it is pretty clear. I think the first half is a little harder, and then the second half is maybe not as easy. But let's just go through it. It says now, uh, actually, can you go up to the very first one? I'm sorry, I didn't put it yet. Now the spirit, uh, some of your versions say explicitly says, expressly says that in latter times, later times, some will depart from the faith. Um, and you'll see that now the spirit expressly says that's not written in the Bible anywhere else, like ever. And so when we start this chapter, 
it's actually really important to understand that this is the only time that it ever says now the spirit expressly explicitly says so this is something we have to be really careful really pay attention to because if this is something that the spirit explicitly says and you never see any time where it says that same phrase again that this is something that's probably really important and you'll see that in first timothy there's some things when we get to verse 9 you'll see that it's uh, not that the other things aren't true because everything in the bible is true just some things are emphasized even more um, like when jesus says verily or uh, truly truly i say to you you know that that phrase even though everything jesus says is true that phrase has more emphasis so here is one statement that's more emphasis the spirit expressly says that in the latter times later times depending on what version you have some will depart from the faith um, and so what are these times if you know the bible you know that the latter times are the times of jesus and after so we are in the latter times the later times and we know that uh acts 2 you see uh, in the latter times, they start prophesying, all that stuff. It, so basically, the latter times, the later times means uh, Jesus until after Jesus. So we're in that time. The Spirit explicitly, explicitly says that in these times, in the latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to, be, to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. And uh, if you guys have taken Aaron's class, or even just started taking Aaron's class, and I guess now it's Aaron, John, and Joyce. But <laughs> if you guys if you guys are in that class, you'll know that, or if you know your Bible, you'll know that you you can't fall away from the faith. It's impossible. But this one says some people will depart from the faith, and so this is talking about people who have never who who look Christian, who have acted Christian, who thought they were Christian, but they never actually were genuine Christians. Some of these people will fall away from the faith. And how do they fall away? It's right there. It's by devoting themselves to deceitful teachings, or dece deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. So, Spirit says explicitly that in these times, in the latter times, some will fall away because they devote themselves to these teachings, deceitful teachings and the deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. Now I know you guys probably because we grew up in LA, like there's Hollywood right next to us. When we think of te demons and deceitful spirits, there's this idea of, you know, when you watch Paranormal Activity or when you watch The Ring or any of these scary movies, right? Deceitful spirits, demons. And that's this idea that we have. And it's scary, but you know it's not real. But I would like to submit to you, that's not, what we, that's not what it's talking about here. This is actually something far scarier than those things. Why? Because the teaching of deceitful spirits, the teaching of demons, they're not going to look like those things. Right? If you see someone who comes and he has like a demon mask on, and he just looks like a deceitful spirit, you're going to run away. It's scary. You're not going to listen to someone who says, I'm a Satanist. You're not going to listen to someone who says, I worship the devil. I practice all of these things, the dark, you know, all this demon magic. You're, you're going to run away from them. But I think what's even scarier is that the teaching that it's talking about here isn't talking about something that you're going to visibly see as super scary. And that's why it is scary. Because you would be so much more afraid of an enemy that you can't really tell is an enemy. If you can tell it's an enemy, you know when to run. You know how to hide and fight from them. But the spirits and the deceitful teachings and demon stuff here that it's talking about isn't always going to be something that you can visibly see really well. Sometimes it's going to be in the context of uh, a teacher who comes up and says, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for 20 years, but I have a new doctrine that I found in the Bible that's better than your guys' <laughs> other doctrine. You see what I'm saying here? He's, he's not saying he's from a, a satanic or a, a demonic cult. He's saying he's part of these teachers. And so that's why I want you guys to be afraid a little, at least have some fear, because some, even in this church, this is the context of church, some will depart from the faith because of these deceitful demonic teachings. It says, verse two, it says, through the insincerity 
of liars whose consciences are seared. And so it's basically, it's through liars. It's through their insincerity. Um, and when it says it's, their consciences are seared, uh, when you guys think of seared, maybe you, you think of like meat or something, yeah, steak, right? I, I agree. But I want you to think of another example would be, uh, you guys remember, you guys know about cows, okay? So cows, yeah, they, they are steak, but if you're a farmer, <laughs> Okay. Cows, if, 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 you're, if you're a farmer back then, I guess they sometimes do it now, but back then they would brand your face with like, to make sure that that was the ownership, that you were owned by that person. So a farmer would brand his cattle to make sure that the cattle, like if it got lost, that you know it's his. Um, and so, but one thing that when you're branding someone, when you're searing them with that hot fire to make sure that it's stuck on them, it's, it's violent, right? It's hard. You have to hold the cow down, but as soon as the searing goes on their face, it's still. The cow stops fighting because it's already on there. The pain's already gone. And so the idea is that, one, the cow doesn't even necessarily know after, after it's been seared, the pain's gone, it doesn't know. And two, um, that it, it, it's, it's basically something that never goes away, right? The cattle can't get rid of it, or like it'd be so hard to get rid of a searing mark. It's nearly impossible for it to go away. And so these two things, that when their consciences are seared, you have this idea of, one, these liars who are telling this demonic teaching, the, it's something that is probably not gonna go away because it's stuck on them. But two, it's something that they might not even know. They don't see it. They don't feel it because it's already happened. So they don't understand. They might, they're, they're teachers who when they lie, their they're insin sincerity, their conscience is seared to where they don't even understand that they're lying, that they're teaching demonic things. And you see why the first statement's even more scary? Because not only is this not a, a, someone who looks like a demon or teaching looks like it looks like, you know, it's looking scary, but they're also convinced that what they're teaching is right. Um, and let's move to verse 3. It says, who forbid marriage and restrain abstinence from foods. So you would probably think that the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith by the teachings of deceitful spirits, demons. You know, you're probably thinking like, man, this is through the insanity of liars whose consciences are seared. This sounds so intense. It must be like the Antichrist or it must be all these scary things that they're going to teach on. Uh, they're going to teach on um, extreme, you know, I'm going to make you have extreme suffering or voodoo or I'm going to all of these scary things. But no. Look at verse 3. What do they teach on? They forbid marriage and they re require abstinence from foods. So it, it doesn't seem like a demonic teaching, right? It just seems like, oh, you know, someone's a little stricter on, on something that we do. And you guys are probably like, okay, uh, None of our church, you know, says abstain from marriage or abstain from foods. Like especially at a Baptist church. Food is something that we love. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> not, no one, no one's saying those things. So how does this how does this relate to us? Because those teachers, they would say that. The teachers that their demonic teaching would lead to prohibiting food. So how does this relate to us? Like we don't prevent anything. Does that mean that none of the teachers that it's talking about here, like, we don't have to worry about that? Because no one goes around saying, don't get married. In fact, a lot of times, like, it's, maybe there should be more restrictions against food, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, it's, it's, it's something that, you're, I'm, I was a little confused when I read through it, because I thought it'd be more extreme. But let's continue. It says, that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. And I want you guys to understand that these these uh, these teachers that they would te the teachers that would talk and prevent these things, it was because they didn't know the truth, and they would focus on these things on food. So even food could be a demonic teaching. Even preventing marriage could be a demonic teaching. 
that they're, they're rules. But he's saying they didn't know the truth. What is this truth he's talking about? You guys know? Say that one more time, Daniel. Yeah. The truth is the gospel. So these people, they didn't know the gospel. And, and Paul's saying, these, you need to know the gospel. Um, last, last week we went through 1 Timothy 3, 13, uh, 3, 15. And that's the next slide, so you can turn there. But uh, is it not the next slide? Okay, it's not the next slide. All right, go to your Bibles. 1 Timothy 3, 15. It's, right, it's the verse right before 4. It says, or 16, I'm sorry, verse 16. It says, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of God we miss, that he was manifested in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. And I talked about this last week. You guys know that? But what is this? It's an aspect of what? It's in the text, but you, you can... Daniel said it. An aspect of what? The gospel. This is what we see in the gospel. And so, Paul's saying that these teachers, they don't know that. They don't know the mystery of godliness that's talked about in chapter 3. They don't know the mystery of godliness. And we talked about it in chapter 1 because it's in there. You know, Paul's whole testimony, this whole story. We talked about it in chapter 2 because it was in there. And it's, it was in chapter 3. And so, chapter 4, they don't know that, the gospel in which he was talking about. Because if they did know that, they wouldn't be following those demonic teachings. And so he's saying you need to know the gospel in order that you not be deceived by these demonic teachings. Do you guys know the gospel? Like I, I don't know if I was planning on talking about this, but I just want to make sure. Who here knows the gospel? Raise your hands. I think I want to talk about it. But, uh, the idea that's going on in verse 15, or verse 16, which was manifested in the flesh, that was vindicated by the Spirit. The idea is that these people, they don't understand that. But yet, we are called to know this. And this is the thing that saves us. And so if you want one thing that's the most important, it's this. It's verse 16. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you guys know about the gospel. You've been hearing it all your life. But the reason that Paul focuses on it is because the gospel is the thing that saves them. And not only saves them, but it's the thing that sanctifies them. And if you guys don't know what that means, it just means changes them. It changes them to be holy, to be like Christ. So the gospel is not only the means in which these people can come to know Christ to become a Christian, but the gospel is the means by which they can change. And I've heard other people say the gospel is the only thing that will give joy, too. So the idea is that the whole center focus of 1 Timothy is avoid these false teachings so that you can focus on the gospel. These people who are saying avoid these foods, they're not focused on the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel is that Christ died for your sins, right? That he literally came down as a man. God came down as a man. And, and I think it's the one thing to just say he died for our sins. But if you really look at how sinful men are, if we really look how sinful we are, we're terrible people. And I think the more you uh, grow up and learn more about the Bible, you'll realize that it says men are dead in sin. It's not just that man is uh, like okay and that God just makes them a little better when they become Christian. No, it's men are straight up dead in their, their sin. I mean, I can think of like my friend. He, uh, before he was a Christian, he, he would drink all the time. He'd get drunk. He'd uh, mess around in relationships. He'd hurt people. He'd, he'd uh, sometimes do drugs. And he was in what we consider messed up. But after he got saved, he became someone that I greatly looked up to. 
Like his character went from someone of extreme evil to extreme growth. Again, he wasn't perfect. But the idea was that the gospel changed him. And I want you guys to understand that all of us, apart from God's grace, would be like Hitler or worse. Our sin is that evil. We would be more evil than Hitler if, if God didn't have any grace in our lives. And so we had to understand is that humans by themselves are evil. And so the gospel, what it does is it doesn't just make someone from you know, partially evil to pretty good. What it does is it takes someone who's completely dead in sin, as Ephesians 2 says, and makes them alive. That's what the gospel's about. And so when Christ dies for your sin, he's not dying for someone who's like just this average guy, who's, you know, I do good things. They, the Bible says that men have done nothing good, not one ounce of good. It says every righteous deed that you've had, it's like filthy rags. That's in Romans. That every ounce of righteousness. And no one wants filthy rags. It's not any good. And so the gospel is that Jesus died for our sins. And what, you guys, what I want you guys to understand is, you guys know the cross, right? On the Good Friday, the cross. Jesus went on that cross. The reality is that Jesus, when he died, he was forsaken. And you guys must have heard this, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why is that important? Because that shows how sinful we are. That the only way that we could be saved was because Jesus had to be forsaken. That God had to turn his face away. Like we sing that, the Father turned his face away. We sing, you know, I'm, I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. That the only reason that you can come to know Christ is because Jesus was forsaken. That's how evil you are. That the, God had to turn his face away. Like Just when Jesus is like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's asking God, you know, help me. In the time of need, in the time of greatest need, when he felt abandoned by everyone around him, he was forsaken. Like, you would think that God would be the one who would, you know, come in and sweep in and be like, okay, I'm there. I never will leave you nor abandon you nor forsake you. Right? That's the Bible verse for us. But the only reason that we can say that Bible verse is because when Jesus cried it out, he forsook Jesus. Right? We think of God, God's never going to leave me. God's never going to turn his back on me. But the reason that God never turns his back on us is because he had to forsake Jesus. Right? Isn't that crazy? You think about it? Like when I think about that, I'm like, man, this gospel costs so much more than I might have thought. It wasn't just God dying. Like, that's already crazy enough. It wasn't just God or Jesus being killed by the Romans. Jesus literally had to bear the wrath that was put on us. And that's why when, when God looks at Jesus on that cross, he says, flee or depart. He says, I want no part of this. You are the tax collector. You are the prostitute. You are the murderer. You're the rapist. He puts that on Jesus. And that's why the gospel is so much more powerful. I don't know if you guys have even heard this or know this, but you guys have heard about Jesus and his death. And he, he that's how we're saved. And this, this, this message, it's about the gospel, but it's, that's not the focus per se. The idea is because of that, we go from being someone who was inherently evil and only thought evil things to someone who possibly can be changed to be good, changed to do good things, changed to be uh, like Jesus. And so, I bring that up, um, and if you guys don't know the gospel, you have more questions, you can ask me after or ask your counselors after. I think that's really important. I mean, you guys know Jesus died for the sins uh, he resurrected three days later. You guys know that. Um, and that's why we can come to be with him. That's why our sins are forgiven. But uh, let, me, let me just go back to the, the text. If the gospel is so important to Paul, 
as he's writing it to these to Timothy. And it's so important. And the reality is it needs to be important for us. We need to understand the gospel in light of that, to understand what's going on here. Because what Paul's saying in some sense here is that many of the people here, the doctrines of demons aren't always going to be things that are scary or that look demonic. Sometimes the doctrines of demons can look very good. When they taught about abstaining from food, it wasn't something that everyone would be like, that makes no sense. It was talking about it made sense to people. And so there could be certain things in our lives that actually stem from a demonic doctrine. I'm not saying like a demon spirit follows you or anything like that, but the idea of that comes from a demonic teaching or a demonic spirit. There could be a lot of things in our life. And one thing I'll bring up is the idea of morality. Being a good kid at church. Even that could be something. It could be stemming from a demonic spirit or a teaching. And what do I mean by that? Like being a good kid at church. Being, you know. See, Paul's saying that the focus should not be on foods. The focus should not be on these teachings. The focus should be solely on the gospel, right? And so even the idea of being a good church kid, like that's nothing wrong with it, right? You should be a good church kid. You should go to church all the time. You should help out. You should say hi to your aunties and uncles, you know, be friendly, be nice. Those are good things, right? But the reality is that these teachers would make it more about the teachings than they would the gospel. And so Paul's saying, don't be devoted to anything other than the gospel. The gospel is the centerpiece. There's nothing else that's more important. And so even the idea of being a good church kid or getting good grades, that could be something that stems from a demonic teaching. And I bring this up just again to remind you guys that not everything that you do at church or not everything that you do is from the right heart. How do we know if it's from the right heart? It comes from the gospel. How do we know if it's the right heart? It focuses on the gospel. Like even the idea of mentorship. If it's only about mentorship, 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 and that's all you're about, that could be wrong. You have to make it centered on the gospel. Mentorship's good. Like all of these things, they could be good. I mean, I, uh, I was in a Christian club, a Christian organization, and we had our advisor come up and speak, and he was talking about, um, he was talking about, hey guys, let's go reach the nations for Christ. And, um, and then after, it just sounded weird. He said things like, you know, I think the best way to reach the nations for Christ is to do super well and be super successful in this world so that they'll respect us and then we can tell them about Jesus. And I was just there and I was like, I'm, I'm, I don't know what to say. Like, it sounds really odd, weird to me. I'm just going to let my friends deal with it. And all, a lot, a whole of my friends, they said the same thing. They said, yeah, you're our advisor. We respect you. But the goal of this club, the goal of this organization was never to be successful so that we could reach people. The goal of this club was to get was the gospel, to focus on the gospel. And so some, even something as simple as that, and I, I mean, I don't mean to you know, like judge his, his, mental, more, uh, his heart on that topic, but just the idea of focusing on something other than the gospel, like you could use that. You could use your success in a place to get the gospel out. That's okay. But if your focus is on that other thing, then that's wrong. And so his focus was there. That's what we talked about, and that's why we disagreed with him, and he ended up like walking away. And our whole it was hard for us because he was someone who was with us for a few weeks or a few months. Um, but we, it was more important that we stayed consistent with the gospel that as our focus, not any other doctrine. Like there's good things. You guys know that those are good things. You know. And that's why, you know, like the idea of let's focus on apologetics, let's focus on biblical manhood, let's focus on even the idea of like uh, discipleship groups or something like that. They're good things, right? But if the focus of Christianity becomes those things, then they become even potentially something that Satan uses. Satan's going to try and use some things like that. 
And that's why I want you guys to be very careful. Um, yeah, I know we don't have too much time, but like, I wanted to just have you guys focus on the gospel. I know, uh, no, that's the point, yeah. Um, anything other than the gospel, if that's your focus, it's an idol and even potentially something Satan puts in to tempt you or to put in to deceive you. And that's why this is scary. Because if you put your focus on being a good student so that you'll be successful, so that people might respect you, so that you might get the gospel out, that's not a godly thing. Not at all. You don't have to be, you don't have to focus on anything that's not for the gospel. You don't have to focus on anything more than the gospel. The central point is there. And so any of these things, a lot of these teachings that they were giving, they would get stuck on them because they were good things. But it wasn't the gospel. Um, I'm going to move on to verse 6 just because we're uh, running out of time. Verse 6. It says, If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, being trained in the words of the faith and the good doctrine that you have followed. If you put the gospel before the brothers, if you put the, avoid the false teaching, all the things in 1 to 5, if you tell them about that, you're going to be a good servant of Christ. If you uh, tell them about, you know, if you, if you have them be trained up in the words of the faith. What is the words of the faith? You guys know what this is? This is the gospel. It's the scriptures. It's the scriptures and the gospel. And the good doctrine that you have followed. If you're trained up with that, you're going to be a good servant. Or if you are a good servant, you'll, you'll be trained up. And then verse 7, it says, Have nothing to do with worldly silly myths or irrelevant silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. And uh, when it says silly myths, I mean, there's people back then in that time who just, like, they get caught up in all these fables or myths or stories. And I was reading commentaries, and they said it's very similar to the idea of even us getting caught up in, like, fake stories or even, like, television shows or movies. So they were relating to that. I didn't know. I mean, I was just kind of looking at that. Um, and so the idea of if you get so ingrained in things of this world, it's going to take you away from the gospel. It's going to take you away from Christ. Have nothing to do with them. That's what Paul says. And he says, rather train yourself for godliness. And guys, what does it mean to train? Like, I mean, you guys know. You like, yeah, exactly. You work out, you build, you build, a, you, you train yourself. It says it's simple. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I was in wrestling, so I know what training is. It's, it's intense. Um, and I, I remember, like, wrestling is super intense to where, like, there's certain times where I couldn't even eat foods. Like, it was just like, I would go to Unicorn for six months. I remember six months, there'd be pizza, and I, I was like, I'm not eating any of it. There'd be foods that were unhealthy, and I said I wouldn't eat any of it. I don't know if any of the counselors remember when I did that. But, um... <laughs> I was so serious on making sure that I was trained up to be uh, fit or trained up to be athletic. But I think more than even just the training of foods, like I remember my, my friend, he, uh, he, he said that for two weeks, he just, all, the, all he ate was salad and a can of tuna each day. Like salad, can of tuna, and water. Because he was trying to cut 16 pounds in two weeks. And he did it, but that's all he ate. Like that's intense training, right? So that's a, that's a lot of times what people would do in wrestling. But even more than that, I think the hardest thing in wrestling, the hardest training, is when you're actually in a match. Because it's six minute the first period, six minute the second period, six minute the third period, and you just hope you don't get the sudden or overtime because that's just gonna you're just gonna die. Because you think like, oh, it's only six minutes, you know, that's a mile, that's no big deal. It's I don't know how long you run a mile, in, you know, but but uh, it's like. The idea is that those six minutes, you're, you're trying, you're using every ounce of your being. Every ounce of who you are. Why? Because if you don't, then that guy will get you on your back pinned. Like he's, if you're not using every strength, because you're both the same weight, you both have been training so hard for this moment. And so if in that first, and so with the first six minutes, you're already exhausted. And then you get to the second one, if you didn't get pinned or if you didn't pin the other guy. You get to the second, and you're super tired, and you're just trying, and you've been conditioning your whole 
whole like year for this and you're still so tired because every ounce like if you get on the back of your mat your whole team's gonna be like man that guy got pinned that's the most humiliating thing to happen everyone's watching you and so the idea is that you're just training so hard so that you'll push through with every ounce of your being so that you don't get pinned and hopefully so that you win the match and that's what it looked like it was that, that, the wrestling that's the idea of training uh, for wrestling and you guys I mean I mentioned Olympians two two months or two weeks ago like Olympians they do that their entire life right from four to 25 training 10 hours a day 12 hours a day they go without sleep they go without friends a lot of times they go without relationships they go without a lot of other activities because they're training 10 12 hours a day why so that they can be the best they're giving up almost everything for that training and it's it's intense but here it says train yourself for godliness verse 8 for bodily training is of some value but godliness is valuable in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come guys like all the training that you can put into sports or the olympians put into if you're an olympian you give 20 30 years of your life for one purpose and they get a trophy and they hang it up and it's awesome in, in this sense Put in the in the eternal view, what value did they gain? Nothing. I don't mean the bash on Olympians or people who are in sports who give so much for it because it's crazy training. There's some value to bodily training. There is, but they give their entire life to one goal. If you're a hundred meter dash, it's to run that ten second race, the nine second race, and that's it. That's what their life's about. But Paul's saying that training is of some little value. But the training of spiritual training, that's of infinite value. And so in light of the gospel, in light of what we just talked about, this training is the most important training. And look, verse 9, I told you that he says this a lot. The saying is trustworthy and full, of deserving of full acceptance. That's, that's, he's talking about verse 8. That saying is trustworthy. Why? Why does he give that extra statement? Because this statement is so important. Like, we have to train ourselves spiritually. We have to train ourselves no matter how painful it is spiritually. Some of us, like, it's like, oh, I, I'm not much of a reader. I just don't like reading. So I'm not really going to read my Bible much. Maybe occasionally. Or some of us are like, oh, I, eh, I can only pray in five minutes or ten minutes. It's too hard for me to pray. Is that the idea of someone who's wrestling and about to get pinned? Like they're just like, oh, no, 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 let's just let it happen. You know, I don't, I don't really want to fight. No, they don't because everyone, they, they can't. It's just be so humility. The idea is, is spiritual things not even more important than that. Spiritual things are so much more important than Bible training. And so, yeah, it is hard to pray. Yeah, it is hard to read your Bible. But the idea is that's what the Christian life is. The Christian life is hard. If Jesus was willing to be forsaken, like, wasn't that hard? That was, of course, that's the, the hardest thing in the history of history. So is spiritual discipline. That it's going to take almost everything out of you. That it should be demanding, really demanding sometimes. Sometimes it's just really hard to pray. But that's what spiritual discipline is about. You have to do it. I mean, I know, I know, counselors, myself, everyone in here, it's so hard to pray. It's so hard to read your Bible, but you have to do it. The Olympians give their life for that one goal. Are not the Christian goals more important? To give your life to Jesus, because Jesus gave his life for us. And that's what you guys have to do. You to get down, study your Bible, pray, read your Bible, worship God. Spend hours of these things. Because if Olympians are willing to spend 12 hours, you know, why can't we even spend one hour? Like, Christianity is calls for so much. And that's what Paul is getting to in this theme. I know it kind of seemed like I went off, but that's ultimately his focus. Go back to the gospel. Go back. That's what his book is about. 
It's about the false, not only the false teaching, but the true teaching that's only in the gospel. Not allowing church, not allowing Christianity to be about just only church, not allowing it to be only about being a good student, not allowing it to be only about being a good kid, but allowing it to be about Jesus Christ and the gospel and your relationship with him. It's not to be about anything else. And you give your life, you discipline yourself for that purpose. And um, let me end with this verse. It says, for to this end we toil and strive because we have fixed our hope or we have our hopes set on, sorry, I memorized the, the, the version. We have our hopes set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Guys, when it says strive, the word literally translates to agony, agonia, which, agony. We have to have agony in this. For we labor, so you labor and strive not for a small thing. You don't labor and strive for, you know, varsity tennis or varsity wrestling. That's not what you're laboring and striving when it comes to Christianity. You're laboring for an eternal God. You're laboring for the God who died for your sins. You're laboring for the gospel, for Jesus Christ. And that's what it's about. Um, that's ultimately what it's about. So, why are we called to make everything about the gospel? Because that's the way we're saved. That's the way that changes us. The gospel is the only thing that sanctifies us. Why are we called to discipline ourselves? Because of the gospel. And that's ultimately what this text was about. Um, you can go to the next slide. Oh, okay. Train your discipline. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But this is the big idea, and I'll just close with this. It just, like, if the gospel isn't powerful enough to change you guys, then there's something wrong with what you're understanding of the gospel. It should cause us to live in a way to where we make it everything. We don't follow the doctrines of this world or the doctrines of the demons or the doctrines of being a good kid or these rules that we set up. We follow Jesus. And we need to give our entire life to him. So devote yourself to the gospel. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Um, if you guys, yeah, like if you, if you guys were, are concerned about, you know, Maybe I, the gospel hasn't been changing my life. Like the gospel is supposed to change you also, not just may give you salvation. Maybe the gospel hasn't been changing my life. I think talk to your counselor. Or maybe you don't, maybe you're sure, not sure you know the gospel. Talk to me or one of your counselors. We want to make sure this is something you know. And that's why, you know, I'd love to have like a gospel series or a gospel night or something to make sure that you guys know the true fullness of the gospel. Because I only spent 10 minutes on that. But I think it's something you could spend hours. Not that I would in one sermon, but let me close for us. God, I thank you for this time that we could be here, God. I thank you, even though um, yeah, some of the things just seemed uh, rushed or sloppy. Lord, I pray that we'll just focus on the gospel. We'll focus on Jesus Christ. We'll not be uh, focusing on being moral or uh, anything that the devil might use to take us away from you or take us away from the gospel. Even service sometimes can be used or being a good student, or being moral, or being a good church kid, that can sometimes be used by the devil to take us away from the gospel. But I pray that you help us to focus on it and discipline our lives, read our Bible, no matter how hard it is, because it's worth it. We should be striving harder than all of those Olympians, because our goal is so much more <coughs> worthy. It's so much better. And it's for an eternal purpose, not just for this life. God, for it is for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our eyes on the living God. We have fixed our eyes on you. So let us in agony strive, live every day for you because you saved us, the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. Uh, give us a good time of discussion groups. You and I are praying.